So welcome to our presentation today about having the right skills for your board. So what we're going to go through today is a bit of background. We're going to go through what's changed and why the focus is now on individual directors and whole board skills and development. We're going to talk about how to rate directors real level of skills and experience. We're going to talk about how we do that and we're also going to talk about the importance of now understanding our board's corporate skills plus their sector knowledge skills. And this brings effective diversity to the boardroom table. We're going to talk about that board culture and, and how do we measure that? And we're going to talk about the director's contribution and the importance of that to the board. We're lastly going to talk about then the importance of individual director development plans on the back of your review processes. And of course, that incredibly important whole board development plan and succession and recruitment plans. In other words, a roadmap for success. So look, the focus now is about having the right individuals that actually gives you a great team. And we all know that when it comes to creating the right team in the world of governance, we actually have a couple of choices. We can actually evaluate our team and see what are our gaps and make sure we recruit on expertise, or we can actually look at what does our team look like now and how can we build the members of our team as a whole and as individuals. And so what I'm really going to talk to you about today is what are some of the key latest things that are impacting on how we do this? So first of all, let me set the scene. And I love talking about what's driving our need to do this. What are some of the things behind the way we need to think in the future? So I guess one of the first and most important areas to start is with the AXX, ASX, Corporate Governance Guidelines. Now, whether we sort of understand this or not, the truth is that these guidelines are set up for those top companies, those top corporate companies, but everything that's in these guidelines always unpacks to us in all our other organisations. It basically sets the culture for how we do things on a board. And in 2018, they've actually reviewed their guidelines and they have nine new recommendations. And it's a couple of those recommendations that we're going to talk about today. But it's quite interesting to know what are the other recommendations that they're focusing on as well. They're focusing on their principle number three, which is no surprise to anyone. It's all about values, culture, and the social license to operate. Don't you love that word social license? In other words, that's the right to do things because you're doing things the right way not just because of who you are. For example, AMP fall into that category, don't they, everybody? They actually prove that they don't deserve a social licence to be working in the future because they haven't done things the right way. The principles around diversity are going to be looked at. The principles around environmental and social risk are going to be looked at. The principles around director independence are going to be looked at. But the ones that we're going to talk about today is the principles around the board's skills matrix. And when I call it recommendation 2.2, it's recommendation 2.2 in the review process, not necessarily recommendation 2.2 in the governance principle. So I hope you just can understand the difference in that. Still, nonetheless, it is something that's going to be changed. And of course, there's a, view, a review of the director induction and professional direct development recommendations and removing ability to, to disclose a summary of key policies. And what they're also saying is the ASX principles need more commentary. In other words, they shouldn't be so ambiguous. They shouldn't be so difficult for people to interpret quite simply the right way to do things. So let's talk about the proposed changes around um, board review for your skills and development needs. So what they're noting is the boards are increasingly being called upon to address new and emerging issues. And we all know those of us who are on boards or work with boards that those issues are around culture, 
conduct risks, digital disruption, cyber security, sustainability and climate change, things like that. And the suggestion is that a board needs to regularly review its skills matrix to make sure that those skills actually cover the emerging business and governance issues. Because what they're saying at ASX is that on the back of quite a lot of reviews, and I'll talk about those in a moment, they're discovering that maybe the way that we've evaluated director's skills and development needs in the past doesn't cut it. In other words, we're not well equipped at the boardroom table to be dealing with what we need to be dealing with. There needs to be greater guidance on what should be included in a board skills matrix. In other words, just the good old fashioned, what are your corporate skills, isn't gonna cut the mustard anymore. It's not enough. And very importantly, they talk about the chair to lead on director review and development. If you ever wondered about what is the role of the chair, it's becoming more and more evident that it's about that leadership piece for your board skills, knowing your board skills and, in, and leading the investment and in director's skills being built. And when I talk about investment, I don't necessarily mean dollars and cents. I mean investment in your time, your valuable time. You can't do everything. So that's an investment that it's becoming more and more evident that should be a priority. The next recommendation is around the periodical review and whether or not this leads to director professional development. In other words, they're saying they're going to change the wording so we're not so ambiguous about that anymore. We actually do need to know what our director's development needs are and that we actually need to do something about it. And they also talk about professional development for directors should be considered where gaps are identified and they are not expected to be addressed in the short term by new appointments. So in other words, there's that thing I talked about at the beginning, that we can build the board we want through recruitment processes, or we can take responsibility for the board we have, understand the gaps, and then accordingly build individual directors' gaps. The other key thing that's driving our focus on individual directors and whole board skills and development processes is on the back of some pretty significant inquiries lately. And look, I don't need to tell anybody that these inquiries and the outcomes of these inquiries are really underpinning the way we have to do this in the future. We can't ignore them. So for example, on the back of the CBA prudential um, inquiry or the Royal Commission into the finance sector, the discoveries were that inadequate governance oversight occurred and it highlighted the lack of the board's ability to challenge management on their reporting. And the inadequate director and executive skills for being able to give and take this constructive criticism and feedback based on the understanding of leadership styles. So let me explain that a little bit better. Basically, what they've discovered is that directors don't just need to sit around the table and say, I'm a lawyer or I'm an accountant or whatever. What we also need to have is a fundamental understanding of our skills, those skills that drive culture, those skills that are about your behavioural styles. And understanding each other's behavioural styles or leadership styles actually enables you to have the ability how to put constructive feedback or constructive criticism of the things that are coming to the table. And this is one of the key things that's underpinning how we need to understand our skills at the board better in the future so that we actually, without offending or taking offence, are better equipped to hold each other accountable, but more importantly, that perfect tension that needs to exist between the board and executive around discussing the things that we have responsibility for oversight of. And another key thing is directors look great on paper with significant corporate governance skills and experience, but they failed in these areas around understanding each other's leadership style and more importantly, being able to give and take constructive 
feedback and criticism. Just crucial things. The other thing that's underpinning our noting that we do have to focus more on individual directors and their skills and their development needs along with our whole boards is that the governance evaluator has just done its 2018 benchmark. And one of the top five issues across the sector was about director skills and experience needing to be not just our corporate director skills, but actually around the boardroom table, we needed people who understood the business they're in. In other words, they actually had sector experience and skills. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But also another key issue was that there tended to um, either be lacking some succession planning, either for directors or some of the leadership roles, but more importantly, some tips or some good processes for how to have a roadmap for how to do the succession planning really well. And last but not least, there is a really important government focus now on board assessment, whole board and individual director review and development. And there is significant new accountability and evidence required to, so, to show that those things are actually happening. So as I said at the beginning, when ASX looks at these governance principles and, and they say them very clearly in black and white, it does drive behaviour. But more importantly, on the ground, whether it's government driving this behaviour, whether it's our findings in our benchmark, whether it's on the back of the Royal Commission inquiries or ASX, the main reason that we should do this is that it actually makes it better for those of us on boards in governance. It actually makes orientation easier. It actually makes it a more enjoyable and more effective role. It makes us have a better chance of having a better team. So whilst I've given you all of the reasons for why we have this focus that are legislative and all compliance driven, the, I hope you all understand that one of the main reasons we do this is because it does actually underpin us being more effective and heaven forbid, being more enjoyable. So let's have a bit of a chat about how we actually set about to achieve some of these things. And what I want to start with is um, some of the people attending today actually sent in some really good questions to help guide some of the things we're going to talk about today. And I just want to repeat one of the most fantastic questions and then I, I think and I hope the information that I'm going to share with you after this is actually going to support the answer. And I think I can honestly say hand on heart from all of us that this is probably one of the most important questions. So the question is, what's the optimum manner in which to suggest to a director after examining their completed self-assessment a method of improvement, especially when a director's self-assessment does not agree with their actual skill set? <laughs> in other words, it's a universal issue that the traditional way that we've done evaluation of our own skills is very subjective and there is a great opportunity for us to think we probably are a little bit better than we are or, or not be fully understanding what the questions are asking us in our skills matrix. And therefore, moving forward, how do we actually um, understand what our real level of skill and experience is and how then can we make that be the starting point for how we all work together a little better. And in answer to that question, there's quite a few things that we can do, thank goodness. So first and most importantly, it's how we actually measure our skills. How do we get the evidence of what everybody actually, their level really is? The breadth of what we measure, in other words, a bit like we've been advised earlier, I was talking about we can't just measure our corporate skills anymore that doesn't show the kind of team we're going to be. And sometimes you might need an external expert to support you with this process. 
So let's talk about rating directors' real level of skills and experience. And I think the most important and first thing to put outside the door is that old fashioned yes or no questionnaire answers. They are subjective. They are allowing us to either humbly say we don't have those skills when we really do, or they're allowing us to say, yes, I have all those skills when we actually don't. And going forward from there is an impossible task around understanding how to build this team. What we do now is use a scaled or a schema approach. And what that means is that you need to fundamentally understand what is the skill that you're being asked about or what is the area that you're being asked about and that you make a choice on a level that allows you to show your level of opportunity for building more skills in that area or if you have significant skills in that area that you actually could have a leadership role in that area or you could support and help others. And this is a really important starting point. Um, the other thing that's actually quite helpful at the beginning of um, mapping your director's skills and development needs is also that you have a little way of mapping everybody's tenure. And that helps to show you that key area that impacts on your ability to understand the kind of team you need and the kind of replacement you need for that team to continue to be brilliant in the future. And the second thing that I want to talk to you about is, so we measure ourselves on different levels so that it's, we're reducing that subjectivity. We actually understand the question because there's more information about it. But the second and incredibly important thing in skills and development matrix moving forward is that we don't just ask about your corporate skills and knowledge. We actually ask about your skills and knowledge for the specific sector that you're in. So, for example, we all want to know, you know, do we have people with strategy skills, finance skills, quality and risk? There's a fairly normal list of what would be a professional director's skills. And when you look at some of those boards we've talked about earlier, AMP, CBA, they would tick these boxes probably at a number five on the schema scale, wouldn't they? They'd have those things covered. But the thing that we've discovered that needs you need to have in your director skills as well to have you covered for risk is to actually understand or have experience in the sector that you're in. And more importantly, not just say in the sector you're in, actually each sector has a specific um, few kinds of skills that help you be a better director in that area. So I've got an example here, which is just the health sector. So it's important to know if you're on a health sector board or a community health board or a primary care board, do you understand the the health system? Do you understand clinical governance? Do you understand data analysis? Do you understand quality improvement, theory and methods? Do you understand consumer engagement and centred care? And once again, they need to be answered on a schema approach. It's not dissimilar if you're on a council. Um, more recently, I've just met a few council members from local government, and they said that it would be very helpful to actually understand what were the people's skills on the council. Because yes, you're voted not necessarily by your skills like other boards, but voted as a public response to thinking you'll do a great job. But then when you actually get into the job, it's about what are the skills I need to navigate the governance requirements of being in this job. And so, if you look at what are the sorts of skills required at a local government level, they would be entirely different to the kinds of skills required at a health service level. But it's really good to acknowledge what are people's skills and experience they bring to the table. 
Another good example is in the education sector. So if you look at the professional director schools, they're probably quite similar to any other sector, but it's really important to have someone who's been a principal or someone who's actually worked in the school system so that on their watch, they actually know how things really happen on the ground. It's not about wanting our directors to be more operational. It's about wanting our directors to have the rich tapestry or the rich diversity around the table of people who actually know how these systems work and what they could, they could smell a rat or they could actually give us all a heads up a lot quicker than people who haven't. And that's the kind of thing that we need to move towards in the way that we measure skills moving forward. Another key area moving forward when we measure our skills and development needs or what does our board look like is that we really have to ask questions about culture and we must ask questions about the director's understanding of their contribution or their roles and responsibilities for their contribution to the board. So firstly, let's talk about culture. You know, this is probably one of the biggest findings from the Prudential and the Royal Commission findings is that they basically said, look, these boards had corporate skills up to the ceiling. They, they now know that they may have been missing some of the actual sector skills, but more importantly, what about the director's culture skills or the committee members skills around culture and their understanding of not only their own, but everybody else's as well. Your understanding of board relationships, your understanding of diversity and inclusion, your understanding of how to ask the right questions. And when you actually go through a review process that gives you the meaning of what how to ask the right question is, and then you choose on a level of one to five, I think you'd be surprised at how you actually may not be as good as you thought you were. Personal attributes, personal behavioural styles. This is the piece around you really need to understand, are you an extrovert? Are you an analytical person? Are you that accountant person on the board who, who has a sort of a, not as expressive and as outgoing as others, but incredibly good at analysing things. You may not be the first person to contribute to the conversation, but you may have analysed it really well. Are there lots of expressive people on your board? Um, as the chair, as the person who's leading this, or as the person who's responsible for leading this, the, you know, the business manager or the governance manager, you actually need to know how is my board made up? And in turn, directors need to understand this particular piece about each other so that when they're giving feedback or don't necessarily agree, that they have the skills with how to give it back in a way that's not offensive but constructive. Likewise, you need to understand the behavioural style or the leadership style of your CEO and executives as well because that also explains a lot about how information is given or how feedback is taken. And finally, we're in an era when we actually openly have to discuss attributes around the boardroom table, such as emotional intelligence, self-regulation. Are you capable of understanding the difference between feedback or comments that are interesting versus useful? Do you understand that about yourself and do you understand how your ability to do that actually impacts on the overall outcomes of the board's role in relation to their oversight or being effective or giving feedback? Do you understand your unconscious bias? Do you actually even know what that means? Do you actually understand that that actually, even though you've just read a board paper, even though you've just looked at all the facts and figures. Do you realise that there's some things in the way we're trained or brought up or where we come from that bias our view of those recommendations, that bias our actual comments back 
And, and knowing that about ourselves is incredibly important. And are we person-centred at the end of the day? The most important culture that you want around a council table, around a school boardroom or around a health boardroom table is that the person or the people or the community who you are there rep to represent have a seat at the table through the way you think, through you always putting them at the centre of your decisions and that you actually uh, know how to do that and you have the skills to do that. So I guess when you talk about skills and development matrices or questionnaires moving forward, it's important that these things are included so that we don't fall into the trap of thinking we've got the perfect team when in actual fact these skills have been overlooked and we don't know what our team looks like in relation to them. Another really important thing is our contribution. As a director, it's really important that we're actually honestly saying this is my job and I actually am contributing well or not. And this helps us to, to show our understanding of key things and do we need some development in that area? Do we actually know our fundamental roles and responsibilities? Do we know the difference between governance versus management? Do we actually know how to make informed decisions? Are we prepared? Are we actually coming to these meetings having read everything? or at least made a jolly good effort to do so. And if we can't do that, what's preventing us from doing that? This is a crucial one. Do we actually understand the business? Have we actually taken time to understand the business? And I know from having been invited onto a board myself, where there was an assumption made by me and by the people who invited me onto the board, that I actually understood the business I was in. And because that assumption was never tested, I became quite a disruptive director at the table. I actually, um, by not really understanding the business we were in, made the mistake of thinking when we were talking about things to do with the business that we should have, that I used to say to everyone we've been way too operational, when in actual fact they were risks that we should have been talking about. And when we were talking about other things, I thought we were being too strategic when we should have been more operational. So I got it upside down. And it's very easy to get that mix up if you're quite good at governance but actually don't understand the business and its risks. Do you understand confidentiality and cyber security? Confidentiality moving forward, um, pretty much most of us now have some sort of electronic device on which we keep all of our board or council papers. Do we understand this new world and do we understand um, the importance of how to behave? And very importantly, do we have individual director development plans? And we're going to talk about those in a moment but they are really becoming more and more a crucial part of our overall board development needs. So let me sum this all up for you. What we know based on the environment that we're working in, based on the feedback from the boards that we're working with, is that a whole board development and skills matrix and an individual director development and skills matrix moving forward needs to look like this. And what I'm showing you is a traffic light report that will really help guide what you need to do in the future on many, many levels. So let me give you an example. When I was working with a board last night and they were talking about their orientation, they actually all said that it would be actually really good, considering we have some new directors on our board or some people who haven't had the best orientation yet, to understand our individual director needs and skills before we actually do our induction. Now, induction is two things. When you come on to a council or a school board or a health board, 
you actually need to understand from an induction perspective the big picture environment that you're in. But your true and next most helpful induction is around the business you're in. And one of the key things that directors are pointing out to us is that if you actually understood what the director's skills and culture and contribution needs were, you would actually tailor that second part of their induction to them a lot better. And we even ventured to say that maybe we will start to have directors who can hit the road a lot quicker. In other words, not leave, but actually uh, be more effective as a board, which, you know, this is all about building an effective team. So this is one of the key things we've learned. So what I want to show you here is the kind of skills and development matrix that you need to inform what you need to do moving forward. You need to have highlighted to you from a schema approach. So a schema approach means you don't just have the good old fashioned yes, no colours. You actually have five different colours. You know, you have dark green, light green, yellow, dark red, light red. They all highlight the different levels of people's skills and experience. You do need to know what the professional director skills are as an individual, but also as a whole board because that helps you plan that part of development and recruitment. But you actually need to know in module two, what is the level of skills and experience for the specific sector I'm in? If you're on a school board, what is the level of skills and experience? If you're on an aged care board, you know, you don't just have healthcare skills, you actually need to understand all those extra things that go with aged care around those business skills, managing projects and so on. What is the cultural makeup of my board and what is my director's understanding of their contribution to culture? That's crucial. If you're the chair and you've got your board to build their development requirements with this year moving forward, i.e. 2019, you'd love to know the behavioural styles or the leadership styles makeup of your board, that would underpin, a, you know, a really important insight for you moving forward. You need to know the director's understanding of their contribution and for those who've been on the board already, what they believe their contribution has been so far. A crucial piece of information for moving forward. I think a little bit of all of this might be helping to ask that crucial answer that crucial question about self-assessment about a director and their own skills. By looking at this map, you will see that there's an awful lot of information here that will help to prevent the outcome being that people have assessed themselves as being way different to what they really are. And therefore, they disallow the true growth and development that could really occur. And last but not least, directors should have an opportunity to then, having been through this process, which is a process of enlightenment, a process of, wow, that's interesting. That's amazing. I didn't really know that. Same for the chair. Gosh, that's interesting. I didn't actually know that about my board then it's about choosing the right development. And what's incredibly important is you should have this map reflecting your individual directors. You should also have this map as an aggregate to represent your whole board because that will help to underpin the next two really important things that I want to talk to you about. A lovely trend that's happening, and, a, and there's really good reason for this to happen, is the importance of the individual director development plans. And remember, that is a universal statement. It could be the importance of individual board members or committee members or councillors' development plans. It's really, really 
a very, very important role. If you think of your role as mayor, president, company secretary or whatever, if you were to ask me, I'd say to you, you need to now, moving forward, prioritise this as one of your important things. And that's around knowing what your individual team's membership needs are and to help them have a very simple but a little plan that they can work on each year. It's actually wise to invest in this. And when I say invest, again, I'm not talking about everybody spending buckets of money. I'm talking about prioritisation. Because let's face it, most of us who are in governance roles, it is not our daytime job. And most of us who are in leadership roles, we don't have a lot of time. So it's all about doing the biggest job you can in the smallest amount of time. And so I'm encouraging people in these leadership roles to invest in supporting your team members to achieve this. And there's some really key things that we've learnt about how achieving this can be done in a very easy but a very inspiring and quite uplifting way. First of all, once directors have actually gone through their questions and understand themselves under those key headings that we've talked about, it is really important moving forward that you only choose a couple of simple goals. Because the thing that we know is that if you weren't doing any sort of development before, moving forward, just doing a couple of things, but them being the right things, will be 100% improvement. The issue that we've had before with director development is that there tends to be a one size fits all approach. And that is, okay, everybody, we all need to do this particular piece of training. Well, we're very lucky because uh, most of our uh, organisations have some sort of peak body or government department that does provide some terrific big pieces of education. But when it comes to the director development that you do within the organisation you're in, there's some much more simple things that we can do. So actions for training do need to relate to the skills results. In other words, the, the test that you did of where you actually sit in relation to your skills needs to drive the kinds of training that you choose. There's some really exciting opportunities in all of the individual direct de development plans that I've been seeing lately about the simple realisation that right next to you or somewhere around the table are other people with the skills that can support you to build your own skills in the areas you're lacking. And a really good example is just in health. When um, directors in health have done this kind of review where they've actually looked at their corporate and their sector skills, they suddenly realise oh my gosh, I've got people with serious clinical governance experience on this board, but I've also got people with great finance experience or whatever. It's that cross-buddying up. It's that acknowledgement around the boardroom table to each other of where your skills lie and don't lie that then allows you to take up a seat next to each other and actually make it... a culture in your boardroom that the person next to you is allowed to ask and it is an amazing uplifting experience and you suddenly don't feel so stupid and you suddenly don't feel so on your own but you suddenly develop this amazing new respect for the possibilities of your team likewise there's also some usually one or two pretty amazing executives or ceos that could support you with this process as well the second piece that's incredibly important is to support directors, though, who do need education and that, that you understand in your sector where that education can come from. And we're very lucky in some of our sectors to have really good peak bodies who do provide education. So, for example, in health, we have the Australian Centre for Healthcare Governance who provide education. We've got VMIA who provide risk education. We've got Aon who can support with remuneration education, with education about risk. We've got many, many amazing support organisations out there. All of the 
independent schools have peak bodies in each of their states who provide great education. But it'll work a lot better if you choose the education you know you need. The final piece that's really important around director of development plans is that quarterly accountability, is that actually checking in, how are we going with our goals? Are we actually achieving them? The next really important outcome of development and skills matrix is that you have a whole board development plan, succession plan and recruitment plans. In other words, that roadmap for success. And this is a crucial and important piece. And I want to really encourage everybody to understand that there is a direct correlation between knowing what your present board looks like and understanding your gaps and actually putting that into your recruitment process moving forward. In other words, I spend a lot of time talking to directors who are looking for boards to go on, but it continually seems to be a mystery as to what are the skills that that particular board wants. So what, you know, the board itself, we need to reduce that mystery by knowing what our gaps are and what we need and actually openly advertising it. Now, some of those who I'm talking to today can openly advertise for the kind of skills they need. Others uh, have ministerial appointments to their board, but I do know that if you do have a very simple way of showing what your present skills are and what your gaps are, that would support the kinds of people recruited by the minister moving forward. Likewise, I know that if you look at, um, as I say, coming on to councils, you are voted in by your community, but when you're actually on that council, you could have a look at what skills do I need to build to help me do the best job I can at governance. So, we know that um, if, when I talk to people in the business of recruiting directors, that if you as a board do know your gaps, you do know what you want and need moving forward and actually putting that into your advertising or into the ether out there, it is really true that people actually do um, increase their chance of people applying. It's really important. So I guess moving forward, what um, I hope we've given you today is just a really good oversight into what are the things that are important for our understanding our individual directors and our whole board's skills and then their gaps and how can we use that information moving forward to actually help our directors build their own skills but also help us with our recruitment processes moving forward. <laughs>